Before we get underway, as is customary, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. In my case, I'm in Canberra, so the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be watching today, may be joining us today. So let me introduce our great panel. Uh, Malika Ishwaran is a senior economist and policy advisor uh, at the Shell Scenarios team. You might say the fabled Shell Scenario team uh, because their, um, their renown is worldwide. And Malika advises on economic energy and climate policies to shape Shell's long-term scenarios. And she also works uh, with Shell on policy and advocacy on the energy transition to support the company's decarbonisation strategy. Really delighted also to have today with us one of Australia's most distinguished scientists, Dr. Cathy Foley, AOPSM. Uh, and Cathy, as I'm sure most of you will know, hopefully commenced as Australia's ninth chief scientist in January of this year. And she came to that role after a long and very distinguished career in our National Science Agency, the CSIRO. We're delighted to have uh, two ANU colleagues with us today. Professor uh, Frank Jotso is director of the ANU Centre for Climate Economics and Policy, and he's a leading researcher on decarbonisation strategies, the economics of energy transition, policy instruments for climate change in the environment, and international trade and investment. And uh, delighted that we have uh, Dr. Ryan Young with us. Ryan is Director for Research and Methodology at the ANU National Security College's Futures Hub. And Ryan leads work on how to integrate analysis of long-term trends and potential futures into effective everyday policymaking. And prior to the NSC, he spent five years working on strategic policy in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Now, before we get underway, a couple of housekeeping announcements. I'll lead um, a moderated discussion uh, with the panel uh, to kick us off. And then after that, we do want to try and make this as interactive as we can. So if you have questions, please do post them to the chat box. If you could just include a name, uh, that would be helpful. I'm happy to ask those questions on your behalf, or if you would like to ask them, the, them yourself, then just indicate in the uh, chat function. So, uh, warm welcome once again to all our panellists, and let's get into today's discussion. And the first topic we want to explore is what COVID might mean for the future, or how we should think about the future in the light of the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to start with Malika because Shell has done some scenario work on this already, which you can find on the Shell website if you're interested. So Malika, for your, from the thinking of uh, your team, how do you think that 2025 and 2030 will be different because of the COVID pandemic? And in terms of policy responses, how should governments balance the imperatives of health, wealth and security, which are three objectives that run through your scenarios. Yes, uh, thank you for that. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so yes, so we've been thinking about uh, the pandemic and its impacts, not just sort of the health impacts, if you like, but looking at what are the you know, impacts of the policy choices that are made during this pandemic uh, to, to support the economy during it and also to, to then stimulate the recovery from it. And, and there, are sort of, it, there are large uncertainties in terms of how uh, that's likely to evolve over the, over the course of this decade. So as you mentioned, we released our uh, three scenarios called uh, wealth, security and health uh, last year to explore some of these critical uncertainties as we see it. Um, a wealth, as you might imagine, is a scenario where the priority is given to reopening the economy. Uh, so this happens in parallel to the pandemic being controlled. So it's a, a story where economic growth bounces back quicker, uh, but at the same time, it's more challenged over the course of this decade as uh, you know, flare ups uh, appear of the, of the virus and, and you know, the responses are need to be put in place to control that. So it's a very uh, sort of bumpy uh, kind of recovery. 
Uh, security is a world where the response to the pandemic is to look inwards and to focus more on self-reliance uh, and, and to whether that's in terms of public health or whether it's in terms of economic uh, activity. Our focus is very much domestic, it's very much on uh, stimulating activity within uh, the economy uh, domestically. And so again, this is a world where, you know, you, the growth is a bit anemic because you don't have the benefits of globalization as you have pre-pandemic. Uh, at the same time, you, uh, you know, sort of have, don't have the coordination on public health globally that's needed to address the pandemic effectively. So this is quite an anemic sort of uh, bumping along the bottom kind of, uh, uh, sort of economy uh, in this, uh, this decade. And then the third one is health, which is much more around uh, securing well-being, which is around, you know, dealing with the pandemic and then systematically opening up after that. So it takes a while for the recovery to take root. But when it does, it's a much more sustainable and stable uh, recovery that, that happens. Now, each of these has different implications for the energy system, for emissions as a result, which is what we're interested in uh, understanding. Uh, now, in terms of the policy, uh, the, each of these scenarios has a different policy priority. So I think all countries will try to look at health, wealth, and security uh, and get a balance between them. But it's the prioritization between those three uh, objectives that will put you in one or the other sort of world. Uh, but what was interesting when we were doing this work was that, uh, you know, looking at uh, a green recovery uh, this, uh, in this decade. So using, uh, investing in things that stimulate jobs, growth, demand today, but at the same time in things that set the economy up for a more sustainable, at least climate context, growth path is a win-win. So the example I always give is on infrastructure. Uh, investing in infrastructure around, I don't know, smart grids, around EV charging networks, hydrogen uh, infrastructure. These are things that will create jobs today at the same time setting up uh, the economy for the transition to low carbon. So I think in terms of policy choices, there's an opportunity uh, in building back from this uh, pandemic in a way that is sustainable. And that will then provide long-term uh, economic stability, economic growth, uh, and, and the other objectives uh, that health, that where health, wealth, and security embody in the longer term. So, so hopefully that gives you a flavor of, of our thinking on this. Can I ask you just one quick follow-up question? So in your health first scenario, uh, it, it looks like the outcome or the scenario that gives the best all round results. Do you see real world empirical evidence for that right now? So this is something we've been watching closely to see what signals we see in terms of what governments are choosing to do. And I have to say it's quite patchy, uh, you know, it's up and down. Uh, the focus is uh, really on getting the economy back in a lot of countries. Uh, with, with not that much regard for, you know, for the sustainability element, the climate element. Uh, and that's something that this, there's a sense that we'll deal with that after the economy recovers. Uh, but we have countries and regions like Europe, which are really taking the lead uh, in, in sort of investing in, uh, in ways that are green. So again, you know, you have the European new climate target to be new climate neutral by 2050. You have the European Green Deal, which is now funding and thinking about how do you fund that uh, towards the target. And a lot of that is targeting the recovery from the pandemic. So I think it's a very uh, sort of a, a up and down story uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what countries are choosing to do. But we do see a uh, positive example like uh, Europe and like the UK, uh, where, where this sort of more enlightened, I guess, uh, approach to, to recovery is, is sort of taking root. Okay, thanks, Malika. Well, I want to ask essentially the same question to Cathy and then also to Ryan. So Cathy, when you think about the pandemic and the way it might change uh, the future, uh, you know, how do you think about um, the next five and the next 10 years? What do you think is going to be different because of the pandemic? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be here. I think the the first thing we've got to realise in the next five years, it's not as though the pandemic's going to go away completely and that we're all, you know, sort of looking longingly for either the end of this year or next year where we're all suddenly going to go on our lovely overseas holidays. Uh, no, we have never had to face um, this sort of approach where having a globalised world where everyone jumped on planes, travelled all around the world, that uh, yeah, we had the ability to uh, share a virus 
around the world so effectively and therefore have to work effectively globally to be able to contain it requires us to do things we've never done before. So um, we've seen during this period, in 12 months, developed a whole range of different um, vaccines and as a consequence, we're rolling them out. But we've never rolled out a vaccine globally ever before. So this is going to be a major human uh, achievement, just doing that, and that will be necessary because it's a, uh, to get to the point where you're able to have enough people vaccinated so that you keep the virus under control is uh, going to require this every corner of the world having, having acceptance of, a, of vaccines within the rate of people who can and can't because of, um, of other, other reasons. So, um, so that's the first thing. That's not going to happen quickly. You know, we've got a lot of people in the world, a lot of you know, places which don't have well-developed health systems, but we, we do still have a lot of world movement. So that's the first thing. The second is, uh, so, I, so it means that I think we're going to have to get used to wearing masks when we travel. We're going to have to get used to you know, washing our hands all the time. And it's just as well this year we didn't have a drought at the same time we're asking to hold our hands under, a, under the tap for 20 seconds when every time uh, we washed our hands, which was to be as frequent as possible. So, there, but there is technological solutions that we're seeing, not just with vaccines, but also saying, well, when we're traveling overseas, or traveling at all, uh, can we get to a point where we have immediate testing so that we know everyone going on onto a, an aircraft or going into a building can get tested immediately so that they know immediately whether they've, um, they've got uh, an active COVID virus or whether they're immune or not. And so that's the first thing. And then once people are locked up together, we've got the ability already to uh, identify virus in, in sewage. And so therefore, uh, we'd be able to have sort of the internet of things working in a new way so that we'll be able to tell whether or not a, um, you know, say an, an aircraft which has traveled from Australia to, to, to Europe has got someone with COVID on it because it will have a, you know, a, a flag coming up saying the, um, the, the, um, the collection of sewage has shown that there's COVID present. So therefore you go through and test everyone on the way out. Again, those sorts of technologies are something which I think will evolve and we know that many of them are on the pathway to doing that and so there will be a level of new technologies that will in the next you know five years or so allow us to probably get a lift up in, in normality so that I think is going to be really critical and then I guess in the longer term what we're seeing though is a little bit of a mixture of where where we're reacting on one level as Malika was saying, we have sort of gone into almost nationalism where you know, countries are siloing down to look after their own public health system, their own vaccination programs, and not really having um, a very successful global approach. I know there are activities to try and make sure that low GDP countries do get access to, vac uh, to vaccines and, and there's some work being done there. But we're not really approaching this particular problem in a global way. But we are with probably, I, I suppose, if you look at um, re, uh, approaching uh, climate, we are seeing a, a more global approach. So, so you know, we've got two, two things going on there. But I think um, one of the things that we're, we are seeing is um, a, a somewhat more global approach to how science is being done, which is going to be critical to solving many problems or identifying ways to solve problems. And we're seeing through the COVID pandemic, uh, open access to, um, to literature, which has allowed everyone to read the papers relating to anything to do with COVID. Now that's the first time that's happened. Normally scientific literature is caught up behind a paywall unless someone's paid extra funds to get it open access. So that has allowed everyone anywhere to be able to access that. And that's just one of many examples of this move towards open, open science. And I think this is going to be something which we'll see grow in the next um, 10 years to uh, become a new way of doing science. So that's probably you know, two aspects of um, bunkering down and opening up. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, and Ryan, when you think about uh, the future or futures, uh, what do you think is going to be different? Uh, thanks, Richard, and thanks for the opportunity to take part in this. Um, I want to focus on kind of the future post-COVID and want to focus on what you might call the second order effects. I'm not going to talk about health as such, but some of the flow-on effects that I think we'll see happen. 
And I'm going to put my neck on the line a bit, a little bit and turn these into somewhat predictions. So you can come back to me in a few years and see how badly I've got it wrong. So the first one that I think is really interesting at the moment is there seems to be signs that um, next five, 10 years will actually be significantly richer. There's kind of lots of signs of um, economic growth that seem to be based on a few things. One is a lot of talk about the pandemic has accelerated adoption of digital technology, kind of five to 10 years of adoption condensed into six months, which is gonna to lead to significant productivity benefits and then kind of drive economic growth from there. Um, another aspect is the whole capitalism, creative destruction. A lot of businesses have gone to the wall that were kind of struggling to hold on. So there may be that element that you know, new businesses taking their place will have to be leaner, tighter, and more focused on making things work. Other aspect is there does seem to be a lot of pent up demand for a lot of these things. And when people do get the chance to spend, kind of like the Roaring Twenties kind of reaction after the Spanish flu, that I think people will spend a lot. So. I see significant economic growth. Counterpoint to that is that I think inequality over the next 10 years is going to be a lot worse as a result of the pandemic. Um, more broadly, the wealthy kind of well-educated people have been able to ride it out pretty smoothly in a lot of, and I say probably most of the people on this call um, hasn't affected us too much and our quality of life may have gone up. A lot of poorer people have been hit hardest, both in jobs, health impacts, um, direct pandemic impacts. I think it's important that this is a global issue, not just nationally, that the World Bank estimated that 100 million more people worldwide will fall back into extreme poverty as a result of the pandemic compared to what projections were otherwise. So I think there's a real kind of inequality story driving out of the pandemic that we will need to grapple with, and that could have lots of effects. Um, a third one that I think is really interesting to watch is in the governance space. Um, and how we make decisions, particularly at the political level, but that flows into policy and businesses. That, to be honest, I've been surprised at how popular in much of the world a kind of zero risk mantra with respect to COVID has been for the public. In the public service, we're always talking about, you know, trying to be less risk averse, embrace risk, kind of, kind of grapple with the risk differently. But the kind of dominant public narrative has turned into a kind of, actually there's some risks that we're just not willing to take any risks on and we want the government to do everything they can to stop that. I think that's going to have lasting impacts on how governments pitch, sell and make decisions. Not going quite sure how, but I think um, the pandemic will be a turning point on that. And the last one, I wanted to pick up some of what Cathy started talking and kind of focus on the kind of international dynamics and talking about uh, nationalism um, borders. Um, I actually think that the pandemic is, I'm quite negative about this, a bad sign for hopes of, particularly at a political level, a kind of global push, global cooperation to solve anything. We hit a crisis, global crisis with the pandemic. What was everyone's response? Put borders up, shut people out, grapple to try and kind of get all the resources for our people. And there's, I think, a feeling, an element that it's looked, you know, Rich Western countries have seemed to have been primarily concerned about their own people, the rich Westerners, and not worried about the impacts on the rest of the world. I think that's a lesson that will probably stick for a lot of the kind of international dynamics, and it's going to make kind of global cooperation on global commons issues a lot more challenging over the next 10 years. Um, I'll leave it there so we can keep going. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Ryan. Um, with a bit of luck, we might have a bit of time to dig into that. Um, and your, you boldly said they were predictions rather than forecasts. And of course, you, you know the old joke about never making predictions, especially about the future. Uh, it's fraught. But I want to switch from the pandemic. We do have quite a lot we want to get through uh, today. I want to switch from the pandemic and come to another example. We're thinking about possible futures is such a critical part of policy and decision making for governments and business and that of course uh, is climate change uh, and the transition we need to make uh, in all the industries that produce emissions but particularly in energy to get to where we need to and there has been a real shift even amidst the uh, pandemic of uh, 
or an apparent shift in the midst of the pandemic on global ambition on climate change. And this is most notable in America, of course, with the Biden administration coming to the United States with an incredibly uh, aggressive and ambitious uh, climate change ag agenda. But we've also seen China and Japan and the UK and South Korea all uh, recently set out ambitious targets for getting to net zero. So I want to bring in Frank... Uh, now, because he lives and breathes um, this part of our collective futures. And Frank, I wanted to ask you, when you look at that, uh, that changing uh, landscape, at least as far as declaratory policy is concerned on getting to net zero, and, the, and when you think about the deep emissions reductions that that's going to re mean, can it be achieved and, and how would we achieve it? Yeah, Richard, look, this is a point well taken, right? So perhaps surprisingly, we have not seen uh, a dropping off or, uh, in terms of ambition for decarbonisation and, and climate goals um, as a result of the pandemic, right? Even when leaders are not able to converge in person and reassure each other um, of, of the importance of, of the issues, this is a very positive development in many ways. And of course, what makes that possible is the increasing optimism um, about being able to achieve this, right? So countries would not be putting forward net zero targets if they didn't think that, that things are heading that way, right? And why do governments think that? Well, essentially because the business community by and large tells them that this is possible and achievable and in a sense, um, you know, in many instances also economically desirable in the long term, right? So that's the background. Um, how, to, how to achieve deep reductions? Well, you know, um, the, the pillars of decarbonisation are, are really clear. Uh, you're looking for an essentially carbon-free, emissions-free electricity supply. Then you're looking to electrify everything, electrify everything you reasonably can um, in any case. And so that's transport starting with cars, but other aspects of transport as well, whether that's batteries or hydrogen. Uh, many low temperature processes in industry and other bits and pieces can all, can all be electric. Um, and then of course you address the rest, uh, various industrial processes, agricultural production methods. You do what you can to reduce emissions. You're then left with some residual amount of emissions and that's why we talk about net zero, right? Because you want to um, compensate for the remaining emissions at the end of the day with carbon dioxide uptake from the atmosphere, whether that's biological in trees, vegetation, uh, algae perhaps, or whether that's uh, technical and, and you know, R&D is making really tremendous progress on, on the technical um, negative emissions options as, as well. Now, um, the greatest progress in terms of as you called it, declaratory policy, and really have been uh, on the on the net uh, zero by about the middle of the century or so. Uh, but obviously, you know, for that to to really have an effect, uh, it needs to translate into nearer term action. And they really look. I mean, I think the most significant thing that has happened this year in this in this space um, is the announcement of the of the 2030 emissions targets by the US. Uh, by the UK and a few other countries. These are really enormously um, ambitious targets. Uh, it will really take some doing achieving those, those kinds of reductions in, in a time span of 10 years. But, you know, um, if, if you're asking what's necessary in order to, to deal with climate change, that's particularly that, that's precisely that, right? Setting a strong ambition uh, and seeing how far uh, you actually get uh, in, uh, in achieving that. And, uh, you know, I mean, when you then look at uh, China, Japan, Korea and Australia, of course, right? So all, all have uh, net zero commitments or targets or statements of ambition of various kinds. Um, and in all of these cases, that will need to translate into stronger uh, ambition for the near to medium term um, and, and, and ultimately stronger, stronger policy action um, as well. And so just to, just to end on, on one note that's perhaps interesting for a discussion later on, this is not just a technological and, and economic issue. This is also an issue of social and regional transition. And certainly in Australia, there's really increasing uh, a spotlight on this, right? Um, so as this, you know, the idea that uh, we will have very large scale substitution away from fossil fuels over coming decades, um, that means a 
very profound shift in the in the economy and ultimately social fabric as well in some of our regions right and and there's many other countries where the effects will be even more drastic than they will be in those regions in australia and that is something that i think collectively these societies will need to deal with and need to face up to um, and, uh, and and there's a really urgent task for policy to come to grips with how to best manage that aspect of a of a societal and economic transformation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Frank. Now, Malika, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation because, of course, it's the climate and energy transition scenarios that have been such a big part of your team's work for some time. So how do you look at um, those international developments over the, uh, particularly over the past, you know, four or five months? And do you still see, and I'm quoting from one of your own scenarios here, a, a technically possible but challenging pathway to get to the objectives of the Paris Accords? Yes, so, so you know, I spoke about our pandemic sort of scenarios, and that's the starting point for our long term energy and climate scenarios. And that's because you're looking at a decarbonization in the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, you know, if you want to be anywhere near the Paris climate agreement uh, objectives. And of that, this decade, 10 years is pretty significant. So what you do this decade becomes quite significant in terms of, uh, you know, achieving that, uh, that ambition. So we released our long-term scenarios earlier this year. Uh, and uh, the, the three scenarios take the starting point of the pandemic scenarios. So the scenario called waves starts with the wealth scenario. So it's all about reopening the economy. Uh, but what happens is the reopening the economy is, is opening it in the way the, the economy was structured pre-pandemic. So there's no attempt to address uh, structural issues like Ryan mentioned on inequality, around climate. And, and so, you know, you have an economy that's coming back as it was pre-pandemic. And you see uh, those impacts playing out in the 2030s in terms of climate impacts sort of hitting. You see the inequality creating social tensions. And as a result in waves, what happens is late uh, but fast climate action. So by the, the 20, late 2030s and 40s, there's pressure to act on these social issues and on uh, common good issues. And so there's uh, action happens on climate, but it happens sort of late but quickly. Now, the island scenario, which is the second one, uh, start, takes the starting point of security. It's all about nationalism. It's all about looking inward. And this is a world where, again, you know, not much climate action uh, happens because there's no global coordination around it or there's limited global coordination around it. And as a result of that, you find that this is a world where economic growth is low so and emissions are lower than they would be otherwise. Uh, but it's not because of any action that's taken, but it's because uh, so the economy itself uh, globally suffers a bit uh, for quite a bit longer. So this is a scenario where it's late and slow decarbonization that you have. Now you mentioned the third technically possible but challenging scenario, and that's our uh, Sky 1.5 scenario. And that takes health as a starting point, where you, uh, you know, a conscious choice is made this decade to put a green recovery in place. So you use this decade to make, to start that transition uh, to low carbon. Uh, and again, this is a, the, the scenario that is consistent with the Paris stretch goal of getting to keeping temperature rise as close to 1.5. Uh, degree centigrade. So we still think that is uh, a possibility. It is technically challenging, uh, but possible. Um, so again, so those are sort of a range of scenarios. But again, what happens this decade uh, becomes quite uh, material in terms of uh, the speed that you need uh, to, to in order to decarbonize consistent with the Paris climate goals. So that's a really good point, I think, uh, to pivot to our third topic, which is how uh, decision makers, whether they're uh, governments or businesses or, or even institutions like universities, can use um, scenarios to make better decisions. Um, governments in particular are very good at putting off until tomorrow what really needs to be done today. Um, so Malika, I mean, you um, are right in the thick of this from a corporate perspective. So perhaps you could just talk briefly about how inside shell these scenarios are used in internal uh, decision making, particularly, you know, when you've got CEOs who, you know, of course, interested in the, the bottom line for the company, they're answerable to boards and to shareholders uh, and so on. 
So yes, yeah, so again, uh, scenarios have been a tradition at Shell for a long time. It's over 50 years that this uh, sort of function and capability has existed in the company. Uh, of late, I think, you know, it's been uh, scenarios, again, are not forecasts or predictions or business plans. But what they do is in the face of very large and systemic uncertainties, they give you a way of exploring what the future worlds might look like in a way that's systematic. So in that sense, it helps the senior, the top of the company, expand their horizons and their mindsets to then anticipate what are the risks that are coming, what are the opportunities to be seized. So again, that's sort of the function that, that we uh, sort of feed into that sort of longer term, more visionary thinking. Uh, now, the climate and energy transition scenarios, the first sort of impact was in 2016, where Shell did a strategy refresh and set up its new energies division. So that was sort of built up on the back of a lot of scenario thinking around the inevitability of the energy transition. Uh, this year, when we released our long-term scenarios, it was uh, not timed, uh, not coincidentally, to, with our strategy announcements uh, the same week. So again, it's uh, our strategy announcement. This uh, was around Shell becoming a net zero emissions uh, energy business by 2050 with intermediate targets along the way in terms of reducing our emissions. And it was interesting that it's not just emissions from our operations, if you like, producing energy, but it's also from emissions from the use of our products. So if you're using uh, petrol, uh, then the emissions from that count towards our uh, carbon footprint, if you like. So again, there was a thinking around the inevitability of the transition, uh, the fact that in the sky 1.5 kind of world, where the speed uh, is of the essence, uh, then that's a world where you have, uh, you know, developed countries reaching net zero by 2050, developing countries reaching net zero before 2060. We very much wanted to be in that pioneer, the leading pack uh, of, uh, you know, driving the transition. And hence, you know, that thinking then fed through into our targets around uh, becoming net zero emissions by 2050. So do you think that Shell would have made that big decision if it didn't have uh, this tradition of scenarios? Ah, oh, it's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I think it helps stretch the mindset. I mean, you, otherwise you're looking at shorter term horizons and sort of plans in that. And what we know here is that making this transition is a long term prospect. You need to start making the investments. You need to start making the pivot. You need to start developing business models that help support and make this commercially viable decades in advance. So it's something where the long term, bringing the long term back into act actions today becomes absolutely central. And as a result, I think the scenario thinking is a way of doing that uh, and, and sort of driving uh, that kind of thinking and that ambition and, and sort of setting a genuine strategy, I think, in terms of not just the next few years, but what does the company want to look like in, in, in 30 years? You're on mute, I think, Richard. Sorry. I, I went too fast. Thank you so much. I, I like that concept about stretching the horizon. And I, I want to ask this question, uh, essentially the same question of Kathy and then Frank and then Ryan. So Kathy, I mean, you've, you've worked, um, you know, uh, for a long time uh, at the, in the interface with government and the business community, of course, and the academic world, the intersection of research and policy decision making. I mean, how and CSIRO itself has done some great work on scenarios in future. So how have you seen this type of work being used well or so, not so? Yeah, so I guess the first thing is, um, I think uh, there's a lot of definitions of how that people describe scenario um, uh, settings. So the uh, one way is um, looking at roadmaps. Another one is actually planning for a major event. Um, I think back of uh, the Olympics in Sydney, I know it's 21 years ago, but I think that was a fabulous example where they had to go through and think of a whole range of different things at the time. And they did a fabulous job. I think everyone remembers that as, you know, hell in time of that. But the thing which they didn't do was the post post Olympics to think of, well, what is the world going to look like after that? What is this opportunity creating and how can we turn that into something which has ongoing benefit? And I think has been uh, that's been held up as, something we did well at one bit, but not following through. And if we look at some of the ways we've been using scenario planning at the moment under a road mapping approach, 
I think the hydrogen roadmap that first of all started in CSIRO and then that um, convinced um, the then chief scientist Alan Finkel to say, wow, this looks like you know, this is an interesting approach to uh, having a transition or an, um, a, an industry that we can transition to in Australia to provide that um, you know, sort of a, a new energy um, uh, business and, and opportunity. He um, then was able to use his role as chief scientist at the time to go through an influence government and so it went on. But the thing that's really interesting is that I think it's tricky when we're talking about these intersectionality type scenarios of which any scenario is these days. So no, um, no one um, requirement for society is in a single government department. And the way we've set up our, you know, we set up our system is to have different blocks of groups focusing on their areas. But where we need to have major impacts to deal with challenges for us requires us to go across horizontally. And we're not as good at doing that, but I'm seeing that there's a, a renewed willingness to approach um, solving some of these problems by going across horizontally. And so far we're seeing this, for example, with, um, well, I'll go back to the pandemic. You know, you know we saw a, a lot of scenario planning there and, there and parts of it were done in health in order to look at the public health uh, approach, but then also looking in industry, trying to work out, do we have all the manufactured products when we, we, uh, we need when everybody is looking for masks and hand wash and, and ventilators? And, and so, you know, sort of those sorts of um, scenario plans are something which I think are probably not always called that way, but it's when we look at a particular urgent situation, I think we've got a great track record of that. And then it's the after when we're looking into the horizon scanning, which we've got some work. I know the um, uh, National Science and Technology Council, which is the you know, Prime Minister's access to advice from, from the research sector, does uh, you know, commit um, and um, uh, get horizon scanning documents in different areas. But quite often they're taken over a long period of time and they're not necessarily sharp and ready to deliver. And so there's this, I think, when you're talking about when does it not work well and when does it work well, I think we seem to be really good at when there's a specific well-defined situation or challenge but then it's um, where it's tricky is when you've got something which is more indefinite and ongoing and it's hard to define where the boundaries are. And that's when it's tricky to really nail down, a, you know, what does a scenario look like and how do you actually look at, at where to next? And I'll just throw in one final one is, um, you know, sometimes too, just asking our questions about the counterfactual, about um, sometimes it is better to do nothing <laughs> and, and to be patient and wait. And then there's the other is also saying, we've come up with a policy, um, we want to go through and push it forward, especially one where there's got potential, you know, social license issues. Do we actually red team it? Do we actually challenge it or put the black hat on, whatever terminology is, to um, really drive us to think with an, um, what are the unintended consequences? Are there things which, uh, when you start discussing this more broadly, that we actually start getting things out of the woodwork that really may not, um, well, the, the scenario may not lead to the direction we want to go in. And so I think um, there's an opportunity for us to open that more and that, you know, sort of that social discussion too, and that um, building up our social license creds in when we're dealing with scenario planning. Right, really important point. And, um, you know, in the public service, you're starting to see for policy processes, people using techniques like a pre-mortem, which assumes that the grand plan failed <laughs> and mm. you look back. Okay, so what did we do wrong? Uh, mm. And try and make sure we don't do it. Okay, so Frank, uh, climate change, well, we, <laughs> we all know this policy is fraught in Australia. Uh, so when you think about the modeling of how we can go about achieving uh, reductions in emissions, I mean, how influential do you see that? I mean, are there, are there ways in which we can uh, use it to better help decision-making? 
Yeah, very fraught indeed. And look, I can't, I can't um, resist going back to the, the curly question you threw to Malika before, you know, like, um, would you have done this without the analysis? I think in general, it is true in this area that those who don't, the anal don't do the analysis or, or don't read the latest analysis tend to, little, tend to be a little bit stuck in the past because technology and, and economics of, of uh, zero carbon technologies move so fast, right? And so every sub subsequent piece of analysis um, shows a quite a different picture and, and opens up the space of opportunities. And, you know, if you're following the, the International Energy Agency's annual World Energy Outlook, you're seeing really dramatic changes in, in how they assess um, uh, how things might pan out, out over the next 20 years. So in Australia, modeling tends to be very influential, okay? Um, often in the positive, sometimes in the negative, uh, when it's used to kind of support pre-existing uh, political decisions or whatever it might be. The Climate Change Authority here has done excellent work in the past and, and, and right now doesn't seem to be quite in the position to do um, uh, such, uh, you know, deep-seated modeling-based scenario work. Uh, again, uh, the immediate task that we have and many other, many other countries have is to come up with a so-called long-term low emission strategy for the country. It's meant to be submitted to the UN climate negotiations uh, before November, and we understand that's under development. Um, but at this point, there's not really a, a sort of a public or stakeholder facing uh, aspect to that process. And so we don't know. Um, certainly in terms of the scenarios, right, that scenario work, not just, not just the middle of the road kind of best guess, right, but the, the very different scenarios around it are tremendously important, right? Um, and business tends to be well aware that they're operating in, a, in an environment of uncertainty and, and governments oftentimes seem to be a little bit focused on that, on that central expectation. And just very briefly, I know we're running out of time, two examples, of course, solar photovoltaics, right? So um, it's now commercially competitive in many parts of the world and certainly including Australia. Uh, and, and the challenges for policymakers, in particular in electricity, are now very, very different ones from what anyone imagined uh, just five or 10 years ago. Second example, uh, the possibility and likelihood, in fact, of, of a trade in renewable energy-based products, commodities, and even energy, international trade. And so there's a tremendous opportunity for countries like Australia um, to be, you know, the green energy exporters of the future rather than fossil fuel energy exporters of the future. Um, hydrogen, but not just hydrogen, also hydrogen for fertilizer, possibly green metals, green steel down the track. Um, and, you know, no one but the very bravest of modelers would have had that on their canvas just five years ago. Yeah, that's... Great point. Um, uh, and just the pace of change on some of these issues is uh, undoubtedly very hard to keep up with, which is a good segue to Ryan. So Ryan, you work with government agencies, public servants who are grappling with hard uh, policy and trying to keep up and think about uh, the future. So what have you seen work and what, what, what doesn't work so well? Uh, thanks, Richard. I think the, I guess, first framing comment to make, and I think some of what Malika was talking about in terms of kind of expanding the horizons, kind of thinking about different things is very relevant, but there's one real challenge when you're working in government in that uh, the agencies work separately from the ultimate decision makers, and so you're often kind of not working hand in hand with the decision makers, the ministers and the politicians, which kind of creates quite a different dynamic around how you use them. So I think one thing that is, needs to work and needs to be done is that the scenario of work, um, alternative futures, however you talk it, works well when it's integrated into other policy work, other capability work, other planning work. So it's not kind of a separate independent thing, but it's integrated into this. Um, the concept that's got a lot of traction around the place that I've seen at the moment is the idea of using scenarios to stress test either existing policies or future plan policies. You know, scenarios gives the options around that kind of explore some of the complexity and it's a nice way of going, okay, we have a policy approach that we wanna use. Will it work under a number of different scenarios to test kind of how robust is it for a future plan given Richard, as he said before, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Um, and I think the other thing, picking up on something Cathy said, 
is that scene scenarios work really well as a way of I guess, bringing together different stakeholders and agencies together in an open way. And it's a safer way often to talk about a lot of the issues and the complexities. Talking about a hypothetical scenario is a kind of nice way to build the ideas, test thinking, explore ideas without kind of fighting over a concrete proposal or a comp concrete budget submission. So there's some things that I've seen work. Uh, what hasn't worked? Um, big temptation is always to try and make our scenarios comprehensive and cover everything. Um, the problem is we can never do that and we tend to end up with really boring consensus driven scenarios which kind of people think they already know and their eyes glaze over. Um, if we're doing this work it has to be interesting or attractive or kind of offer something. Um, I think the other thing that doesn't work is where you've got pre-cooked outcomes that you're trying to drive at with a scenario, you, if you're kind of implicitly using for education or prove a point, um, that turns people off often. They're really interested in it as an analytic tool. If they feel like they're being kind of preached at or tried to be convinced via a scenario, it's turned off, but it can be really tempting. Thanks, Ryan. I might just add one example that worked personally well for me in which um, uh, the Futures Hub actually had a role. So when um, I was doing the foreign policy white paper in 2017 and we had our policy framework, we then got help from uh, the Futures Hub to build us a couple of simple uh, regional futures and we tested or war game some of the policy uh, against those futures um, with a collection of sort of very smart people with uh, minds that liked contesting orthodoxies. Um, and that um, was actually very helpful in clarifying our thinking around some aspects of the white paper and also in understanding where it might begin to fall apart uh, in possible futures. Uh, now, look, we've got um, just under 15 minutes to go. Uh, because we've got uh, two people who think a lot about the future, I've got two rounds of kind of quick fire questions about the future for each of them. And that will probably get us to the hour, but there is still time. If people had a question, please do post it into the chat box. So my first round of quick fire questions was um, to all of the panel, what do you think is going to surprise us over the next five to 10 years? Uh, and if I could get Frank and then Ryan and then Kathy and then Malika in that order. So Frank, why don't you go? Okay, I have to unmute myself here. So, so now you're asking, different, you're asking us to make predictions, right? So um, of course, it's not a prediction, but I think that we will see renewable energy and electrification growing even faster, faster than most people expect. And that means then also faster displacement of fossil fuel. Uh, assets. Uh, in Australia that spells power station closures faster than anticipated, as was the case with each previous one of course, um, and, and weakening export demand for coal and later gas again probably faster than we expect. On the upside of course very large new investments um, including in hydrogen based industries I really expect that all of this will gather uh, steam faster than we might think. So Frank, quick subsidiary question, led by business or by government? Led by business um, with the occasional facilitation uh, by government. So with many of these things, uh, governments will need to get out of the way. Uh, with some aspects, governments will need to create the right framework conditions, and particularly, for example, in a national electricity market, that's the case. And in other cases, governments are, uh, are well advised to help with the startup investment, first of the kind type investment. A good example, for example, the, the, the relatively small scale investments that the ARENA, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, announced today into hydrogen, green hydrogen production facilities. Okay, thanks, Ryan. And uh, sorry, Frank, and apologies for the double barrel question. Ryan, your go. Um, I'll jump in with one thing quickly. So, uh, I think uh, our kind of national state politics um, will be even more volatile and erratic than we think is possible. Aftershocks from the pandemic, digital disruption, and a whole lot of social inequality problems. So, uh, we think last year, last 10 years has been volatile at the federal level. I think the next 10 years will be worse. 
So that's in Australian, that's Australian politics you're talking about. Uh, and well, uh, uh, rich Western countries particularly. I think Europe's going to be in the same position, the US the same, so. All right, well, that would definitely be uh, interesting. Kathy? Yeah, um, I was thinking of what Frank was saying, but I'll add something different, which is, I think we're going to see quantum technologies and quantum computing come to its own and really charge forward with the ability to do things we just can't currently do. And uh, an example will be a quantum computer that can design uh, new science experiments that allow us to crack uh, the issue with uh, developing catalysts that allow us to uh, do things which we can't do uh, with um, say splitting ammonia so that we're able to do really fast track some of our drug development management of um, of you know hydrogen which ammonia comes adds to but also the other is um, allows to handle much larger databases and also uh, have a whole step up in what's possible with machine learning and artificial intelligence okay uh, thank you, Cathy. Malika, what do you think is going to surprise us over the next five to ten years? I think the pace of change, once uh, governments, businesses and society in general align behind the objective and the need, I think the pace of change, uh, once that alignment happens, I think there'll be a sort of innovation, the extent of innovation in low carbon fuels, technology solutions will surprise us uh, and also uh, in the end the cost if you like the resource cost of making that change will be a lot lower than what we think today okay thanks malika this um, question reminds me of when i was um, the head of the office of national assessments and we did used to try and uh, do forecasts about uh, big picture change but of course it was laden always laden with uncertainty and governments would say well what of this are you certain about and uh, we would say uh, not much and they would say well what are you certain about and we would think for a while and say the only thing we're certain of is that things will happen that we haven't thought of <laughs> governments used to find that incredibly unhelpful okay my second quick fire question um, so Actually, in all of this discussion, we have had quite, I think, a lot of positive, optimistic takes about the future. Uh, often we don't get that in these discussions. Uh, certainly national security experts always tend towards the bad news. So the second question was, what good news uh, do you think about uh, for the future? And I just want to reverse the order we've just had. So Malika, if we could start again with you. Yes, so I think, uh, you know, despite the pandemic, which is, you know, more than a year now that we've been sort of uh, living with it, uh, I think action and the realization and the action on climate has, has continued uh, unabated. And the fact that I would put out there is that as the latest count, we were uh, looking at this, over a thousand companies have come up with some form of net zero ambition by 2050. And as Frank was mentioning, over 120 countries have come up with net zero uh, targets. Uh, for, for 2050 again. So I think to me, the, the sort of the, in some ways, the downside of having this pandemic and that nationalism is also sort of a realization of the role of uh, sort of government, the role of businesses in the public good uh, and the need for that intervention. And that you see that reflected in some sense in the, you know, the pace of climate action continuing despite sort of really challenging economic conditions that everyone's facing. Okay, thanks, Malika. Kathy? Yeah, um, I think uh, my um, good news is that I, the movement towards open science, open access, so that uh, willingness of researchers to share their data and be more cooperative, and that's, that is actually a pathway to for um, soft diplomacy, so maybe that's a good sign of keeping any um, doors open where things are possibly closing. But also, I think will lead to better science, faster um, commercialization, and it will also allow everybody to be able to access research literature, whether it's industry, schools, um, professionals, government, and I think therefore will give a pathway to have better, better um, information so that we can get rubbish and fake news for free on the internet, but hopefully we'll be able to get good quality research on the internet, I mean, basically open and ac accessible. Thanks, Kathy. Ryan? 
Um, I'm going to kind of expand a bit on what Kathy was saying. You know, globally, um, the population is wealthier, far better educated, and kind of than it ever has been before. So, in terms of not just the open science, but the broader, I guess, innovation ecosystem of smart, educated people looking to solve problems is much, much deeper and bigger than it ever has been in the past. So, the potential for people out there to come up with kind of great new solutions to things that we never thought of is far greater than it's ever been. You know, there's billions of people who can do it now as opposed to tens of millions that there might have been 30 years ago. Okay, uh, you're making me feel mildly, mildly optimistic. Frank? Yeah, look, my response to this is actually quite similar. You know, collectively, with some appropriate resolve, we can actually do really big things, right? And, and the pandemic has been absolutely devastating in parts of the world. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, the response, the COVID response in many countries, and, and very fortunately, including ours, has shown us that, you know, we, we can do amazing stuff when, when people agree to pull in the same direction. Um, and of course, you know, on the, on the technology side of things, um, the fact that vaccines were developed and are being rolled out at this incredible speed, right, um, is, is a thoroughly positive thing. Uh, and, and that can make us very optimistic, I think, that uh, similar progress can be, could be achieved on climate change. Okay, thanks, Frank. Look, we do have, uh, we've got two and a half minutes left and we have one question, so I'm going to squeeze it in. We have a question from uh, Caitlin Byrne. Uh, her question is, given the complicated technical and transformative nature of policy solutions required to address issues facing the globe, how should decision makers bring public audiences along in the process? Now, we don't have time for you all to have a go at this, but maybe either Frank or Ryan, I don't mind, one or both of you, anyone game? I'll, I'll be very quick and maybe that gives our guests some time to, to respond as well. I think policymakers should take these big challenges in the same spirit as your last question, Richard. Namely, you know, what are the opportunities, right? Um, what, you know, look back from a hypothetical of having achieved uh, a very good outcome. How did we get there, right? And that shows the way um, and, and bring the community along um, on, on that positive journey. Um, Marika, do you have any thoughts on this from a, in a corporate perspective? I think one of the things that's come out very clearly for us is that making change at the pace required uh, for Paris, uh, then it, it requires society and communities coming along. And it's not just about managing the risks or the downside of the transition on the sort of the most vulnerable. It's also about setting a vision of having an energy system that's more equitable. Uh, and, and beneficial to society as a whole than what we have today. So it's sort of a story around not just managing and minimizing risk, but also seizing the opportunity to have a system that helps correct some of the inequities of the past. Okay, Ryan, you were leaning forward. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, one quick thing, I think decision makers and policy makers need to take the time to understand the kind of general public. They kind of use different terms, think about things differently. And kind of, unless you can't, if you don't understand them, you can't bring them along. Kathy, anything to add? Social license is always very important um, to be able to make major decisions. And uh, if you look at things where we've done it poorly, uh, genetically modified foods is a good example where uh, science rushed forward with what they thought was great without bringing the social license with them and eventually you know, went through a long process. And, and as a consequence, um, I think it's, it's, it's something which is much more accepted than it was originally. Um, right through to um, you know, introducing particularly um, uh, technologies or uh, policies that are really quite uh, ch big changes to the way we operate. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of that in the next 10 years, but we've got I think to make sure that we do it in a way that we don't end up with things like Bodhi McBoat face as the outcome from the, you know, <laughs> gathering people's ideas and having it collected in a way which really is, um, is providing that deep thought. And uh, how you do that is a challenge. 
because quite often we're swayed by local media, I mean, social media and, and you know, sort of interest groups and not really hearing the full spectrum. So that's the biggest challenge is actually how you go about getting the true, um, true public engagement so that you don't end up with um, interest groups having an overstated um, ability to sway decisions which may not be uh, of benefit for the, for the majority. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Cathy. And for those of you who don't understand the reference to Boaty McBoaty face, just Google it. It's rather entertaining. Um, okay, our time is up. Uh, we've covered an incredible amount of ground very quickly. I really want to thank our panellists who've been concise and sharp and disciplined and helped me get through all of that. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, particularly wanted to recognise that we did get Malika up rather early uh, to appear uh, bright and sharp at 7am when many of us are not at our best. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joined us um, on the conversation today. And I hope you have um, a good evening uh, and have uh, left this session feeling positive because I have about the future or the futures. So thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>